Library Estimate. We'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for joining Katie Noonan at the Library Estimate. We're very glad to have Katie here with us today. She's one of Australia's greatest singers and she's in town for a few days for Music Matters. So we're very lucky to have invited her to the library to give us a special performance and to share about her life and music with all of us. So um, just a little introduction before Katie. I'll let Katie take over the stage. Um, Katie first make her made her big break as part of George, a pop rock group formed with her brother. The release of their debut album produced their first number one single and award for Best New Artist in the Australian Recording Industry Association Awards, the ARIA Award. So she went on to release three solo albums to much acclaim and collaborated with other great Australian performers. Recently voted one of Australia's top 20 singers of all time, she has won four ARIA Awards and gone platinum seven times. So with that, I shall let Katie take over. Thank you, Katie. Hello. Good everybody. How are you? Great. I trust that everyone speaks English okay. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to <laughs> understand my um, speaking today. I was just wondering, um, are many of you practicing musicians or lovers of music or playing music? Um, who plays music? Okay. And um, like professionally, or are you studying music? Studying music, okay. And, okay, cool. So, um, well, uh, that helps me because I can talk about some things that are a little bit more related to performing music, I guess. But um, I'd like to keep this as informal as possible, so feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, I might start off with um, <coughs> a song of mine. Uh, this is a song of um, a record I did with my band The Captains and um, it's a song called Emperor's Box. It's a song that I wrote uh, for my dad. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Anyone have any questions? I've been very shy. Um, okay, well, I thought rather than just play the whole time, I might talk a little bit about my process as a singer. Okay, hopefully that won't be too boring for people that aren't musicians. Um, um, so I'll just go through a few basic things about um, what I try to do as a singer. And, and um, uh, yeah, so the most important thing um, when you sing is your breath. And um, without breath support, you're not really able to sing for very long. So um, we can do an exercise where we can try to find, basically trying to uh, get to your core diaphragm muscles, which are kind of the big muscles down at the bottom of your tummy. Um, if we, I, I believe that everybody can sing as well. How do you, how do you guys feel about that? No? Yeah? I believe everyone can sing in libraries too. How do you feel about that? Yeah? Good? No? Okay, well I'm going to suggest that we sing a note together and we sing for as long as we can. And when you start to run out of breath, you'll start to feel these muscles right down in the bottom of your tummy start to tighten and uh, not well, tighten but um, flex I guess and these are your diaphragm muscles. Anyone that does Qigong or Yoga Tai Chi will know about these muscles because they're the muscles you use with all those um, martial arts and uh, yoga practices. But we'll sing a note together um, so let's just say Too high, not too low. Voice can go down the octaves if you like. So we're going to sing one note and try to sit up straight and um, feel your. Just be aware of your breath and your stomach muscles. So we'll sing this note, and as you run out of breath, you'll feel these. If you can feel these muscles, I'm sure you will. You'll feel these muscles, and they're your diaphragm support muscles. So ready? Big breath in. So they're your diaphragm muscles. That's the kind of easiest way to find them because it's hard to describe. Um, so they're the muscles that you want to access all the time that you're singing. Basically when you're singing you don't want your chest to breathe at all. Day to day when I'm talking to you now I'm kind of talking through my chest and you can see my shoulders moving and it's a little bit noisy but when you're singing it's a really quite a different process even though it's the same instrument in that it's your lungs. Um, you need to engage these core muscles. So that's the first thing. If you want to learn how to sing, you have to understand your body and understand the muscles required to um, support your sound. Um, the other main thing with singing is your posture. Um, I'm sitting, which is not ideal. Standing is usually a bit better. But um, just making sure that your, your spine is... You kind of imagine a... Um, uh, a piece of string from the back of your head and you want to try to keep your jaw and your neck muscles really relaxed. One of the first things to happen when you get nervous is your muscles tense up so often singers will get quite tense in the neck and um, so that's the other main thing about singing is just being aware of your posture. Also of course the other thing that happens when you get nervous is that you um, your breathing goes just you know if you get nervous you suddenly get short of breath and start sweating and if you've got a concert and you're nervous that's hard because you want to have these big beautiful breaths so um, uh, it's just it's important to be aware of posture and breathing as probably the two biggest things in singing um, and for me I can't wear high heels I know some singers can wear amazingly high heels when they sing but I have no idea how they do it I like feeling grounded <laughs> and on the floor um, I take my hat off to people that can sing in high heels but for me to feel my instrument I need to feel pretty grounded um, so yeah breathing and posture um, you should always warm up before you sing um, and cause it's it, it's like if you have, not you know, I don't know, maybe not so much with modern cars, but when I grew up, my dad would never drive his car unless he'd warmed the engine for 10 minutes beforehand. 
And the voice is the same. You, it is part of your body and your body needs to be warmed up um, before you sing. So um, humming and just any sort of warming up exercise to gradually warm the voice up and feel the voice. Starting off with humming and then um, more long tones and then working up into your head voice. You don't want to go straight to your head voice because you need to warm up the engine. Um, I, I could go into it in a lot more detail, but I feel I might alienate non-singers a bit too much. So, does anyone have any questions as I'm going along? How 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 can tone deaf people sing? Okay, well intonation. That's the other thing. Um, that's the biggest, hardest thing for a singer because. You know, you play a note on a piano and it's in tune, because it's an E, and saxophone, but obviously violin and voice are the two instruments, the main two instruments that you have to find the pitch yourself. Um, there are various theories on that. Uh, ear training, I do it through a process of kind of synesthesia, so colour and sound. Um, so I don't have perfect pitch. Some people are born with perfect pitch, which means that I can play any note and they'll know what note it is. Um, but I have relative pitch, so um, I can tell the relationships between pitches quite easily, which is lucky. Um, but my mum's an opera singer and she's had people come to her who really were quite tone deaf and she's managed to just, through gentle persuasion and then being relaxed, and learning pieces just over and over and over again. Um, much like children learning the times tables, you know, you learn a song over and over again and listen to it a lot and try to train your ears to hear to hear the pitch. And sometimes, yeah, synesthesia colour association can help. Like you can associate colours with certain pitches. That's what I do. Um, and I also imagine a note as a round um, hole, I guess, and I try to go right to the bullseye in the middle of the hole, like a, um, what do you, call it? you know, bow and arrow. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think I, ha I think it can be done. I really do. I've seen amazing results with it's just small steps. Um, are you suggesting that you're that you are tone deaf? No. no? <laughs> so well, someone, pardon me. Oh, your wife is, and she loves singing loudly? She loves singing. <laughs> <laughs> that can be painful if someone is tone deaf but blissfully unaware that they are tone deaf. <laughs> um, no, I really think you can do it with a, with a good singing teacher who's very supportive and loving and gentle. Um, the thing about singing is that it's quite... Um, what's the word? It's because it's from you, it's from your body, there's a certain fragility involved in exposing that sound to come from you. You know, if you play the piano and it sounds bad, you can, play, you can blame the piano or the action or whatever. But, you know, your voice is your voice, so you need to feel um, safe and looked after and, and gentle. And so I think music teachers should always be gentle and loving with their students, particularly children, because um, if they don't enjoy it, they won't continue doing it, you know. Um, it needs to be fun, so... Yeah, but there's a lot of different theories on that, but um, colour association is a really good one for really tone deaf people, <laughs> so um, that might work. Um, does anyone else have a question? Yeah, hold one up. Hello. Beautiful voice and beautiful lyrics. Oh, thank uh, you. Just not non-technical question. Yeah. Um, actually, you answered a little bit of what I was going to ask. I guess music is in your family, so your mom's still pressing. Yeah. Um, so for you yourself, has have did you always know that music was going to be part of your life and the choices of being a singer um, and doing this professionally? How did that come about? Um, yeah. Just. Yeah, so I come from a very musical family. My mum was an opera singer and my dad is a journalist but was also a jazz singer. So kind of like a kind of Frank Sinatra style crooner guy. And then my grandparents, m my grandfather was a clown um, and uh, but also a, mus a musical clown. So he played with famous uh, 
um, we have a famous thing in Australia called the Tivoli Circuit, which was a touring kind of, I guess, a bit like, I guess if you had to call it, now you'd probably call it the circus or Spiegel tent kind of um, carny thing. Uh, but that's what my grandparents did. And my grandmother was an opera singer as well. And then my other grandmother was a pianist. So yeah, it was everywhere. And music was constantly playing in our home. And my mum taught from home as well. So it was pretty much 24 seven. But I never actually, I always associated with music with um, escapism and, and, and fantasy. Because my mum was an opera singer and I'd see her, you know, making my lunches for school in an apron and then the next night I'd see her being Madame the Butterfly in, in you know, Puccini's Madame the Butterfly, Cho Cho San in Madame the Butterfly. Um, it, was, it was this fantastical world and I never thought it would actually be my career. I thought I, I was going to be an investigative journalist. That was my... Um, I worked at the ABC, which is our national uh, broadcasting, uh, our national media um, organisation in Australia. I did my work experience there because I was quite convinced I was going to be a cutting edge journalist. Um, but yeah, we, uh, but then I ended up getting into the opera degree and I started opera. And I discovered that I didn't love opera enough. With anything in life, I think, with any pursuit, you have to completely love it and be obsessed with it, particularly music, because it's not an easy life. And it's also got an extraordinarily low success rate. <laughs> you know, um, I graduated with perhaps 300 music students in my year, or probably more, but only a handful of us are full-time musicians, performing musicians. A lot of them teach, obviously. But, um, uh, yeah, being lucky enough to be a full-time performer is actually quite a rare, you know, it's a rarity. So it's not an easy life, so you need to completely love it. And I knew I didn't love opera enough, so I moved into the jazz department at the Queensland Conservatorium in Brisbane and fell in love with the escapism and the freedom of jazz. Um, and then at the same time I was performing in my band. And so I've always had various different projects going in different worlds, I guess. But my two main loves or no, three, classical, pop music and jazz, I guess, are my three. Uh, and, and when I say pop, that includes, for me, pop of its time, like Joni Mitchell or Stevie Wonder, which people probably categorise as something else. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, so music found me, and my career was a series of um, happy accidents, really. And I've always been obsessed with just trying to find my own voice and trying to sound like no one else. Uh, I think the current music scene that we have is very much about, there's a lot of generic music with a lot of singers that sound the same. Um, so it's hard, but great music, I, I still believe great music and great voices will still come through, you know, like, um, I, you know, I noticed CeeLo Green's playing here this week. He's got an amazing voice and he sounds completely unique and like himself. So, peop you know, great uniqueness will still um, shine in a sea of imitators, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, does that kind of answer yeah. your question? Yeah.